I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, 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 hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. You know what I've been doing? What have you been doing? Well, it snowed last night, and when I looked out onto the lawn, I saw some pigeons all huddled up standing in the snow, and they look so hungry and so cold that I took them some breadcrumbs and some of my cereal, and, and, and I threw it in the snow and fed them. Well, that was very kind of you. Yeah, and their colors were so pretty in the sun. Mm -hmm. And you know how some birds always look just alike? Well, that is if they're the same kind of a bird. Well, you know, the pigeons all look different. All of them had different colors. Only a, a few looked alike sometimes. Yes, that's the interesting thing about pigeons. If you have 40 pigeons, you're apt to have 40 different patterns of pigeon clothes. Yes. Now can we read and, and see what interesting things are in the bunnies today? Puck the Comic Weekly? Mm -hmm. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic witch for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. <laughs> After sending the steamboat with Hoppy locked below into the rapids, Maker had escaped and headed for shore in a rowboat, sure that Hoppy would be killed. But Hoppy fooled Maker. He escaped when an engine crashed through the side of the steamer, opening a door to freedom. Meeker rode straight to shore, into the hands of California Lucky and the Marshal, who heard the sound of his oarlocks approaching. A little later, they saw Hoppy swimming to shore. And now Hoppy is safe, and Meeker is caught. Last picture top row, they mount their horses. As the Marshal says, There's a cell waiting for him back at Pike's Landing. Better start. It's a long ride. They head for Pike's Landing. They pass through a thick part of the woods. Suddenly, Meeker, who is riding on the same horse as the marshal, seated behind him, grabs hold of a low-hanging branch, pulls himself up, kicks the marshal in the back of the head, and drops to the ground, then disappears into the brush before the others have time to act. Last picture, second row, Hoppy shouts, Meeker's escaping! Stop him! Stop him! First picture, bottom row, short time later, Meeker stumbles out of the underbrush into an opening where he sees Iron Claw, the Indian chief, and some of his braves. They have fled here after the battle at Pike's Landing. Only a few are left, and these are wounded and sick at heart. Meeker gasps, Iron Claw, Marshal and Cassidy's crowd are after me. You've got to help me. Shoot them down. Iron Claw replies, That not bring back dead braves. Cavalry come to Pike Landing. Destroy Iron Claw tribe because Meeker is false brother who gave evil counsel. Rifles, bad medicine. Will you agree to the bargain? And what, what more do you want of me? Hours later, Hoppy and the others come out of the woods. They see a body lying in the clearing. California says, Yeah, it's him, all right. Marshall, seeing an arrow in the body, says, Hey, why the arrow instead of a rifle? Hoppy says, last picture, You'll never find him, Marshal. They left that arrow as a symbol of another kind of justice that finally caught up with Meeker. Oh, I'm glad that Hoppy escaped from the rough waters of the rapids, and now he's safe and sound. Yes, he didn't drown in the river as you thought he would. No, and now the end of the long trail, and they've got Meeker at last. Yes. I wonder what'll happen next. Well, maybe this story isn't over yet, and if you're here next week, you'll find out for sure. Oh, I'll be here. Fine. Now? Oh, now, let's turn over the page, because I'm sure Prince Valiant's on page three. All right, over the page we go. See? See, I'm right. <laughs> oh, and there 
there was a terrible battle between the Danes who were attacking the kingdom of Prince Val. Yes, and things are beginning to look bad for Val and his father. And then Voltar came just in time, and he fought so fiercely. And then the horn sounded retreat. I wonder who's blowing the horn, the Danes or Prince Val's men? Well, let's find out right now. Here we go with Prince Valiant to the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> King Aguar, Val's father, has tied his ships together, forming a wall of ships. The sails are set, and the wind has been blowing their ships toward the shore. The Danes have been slowly forced backward during the fight, until the rocky shore is now at their backs. Big picture, top row. King Aguar's strategy is working. The Danes see their ships will be forced on the rocks, where they'll be crushed. And first picture, next row, horns sound the retreat. One by one, the Danish ships leave the battle and race for the shelter of the nearest fjord. Next morning, first picture, bottom row, when dawn comes, Val looks to the fjord where the Danish fleet had gone. It's empty. During the night, the Danes had slipped away. The fight is over. But though they have been stopped this time, the Danes are undefeated and will return stronger than ever. Last picture, King Aguar gathers his household together on the deck of his great dragon ship. Then he calls for the outlawed Boltar. As Tilikum and Alita watch, Boltar steps forward, a defiant look on his fierce face. Oh, I wonder what King Aguar will say to Boltar now. Yes, will he punish or reward him for helping in this fierce battle? Oh, I'm sure he'll do something nice, but he'll do it in a clever way because King Aguar's played cute little tricks on people before. Well, I hope you're right. Next week we'll find out. Now? Oh, now, let's just turn over the page and see who's there. All right over the page we go. Oh, oh, look, there's Donald Duck. Yes, and look across the page. There's Uncle Remus. Oh, both my favorite, favorite. What's Donald doing today? Well, Donald's in his car on his way to see his girlfriend, Daisy. And he gets lost and can't find the right street. Then when he thinks he's found the right place, he comes to a dead-end street. Finally, he tells a taxi driver to take him to the house. The driver says, Check, 62628, Muddy Lane. Okay, hop in. And Donald replies, last picture, Oh, I don't want to run. Just lead the way, and I'll follow. And the driver goes, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. He pays the taxi driver to go ahead of him and show him the way. <laughs> yes, no wonder the driver was surprised. Now please read me, Uncle Remus. Very well. Across the page to page five we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, Yes, sir. Br'er Rabbit has got the knack of skinning folk who tries to skin him. Yes, Br'er Rabbit has decided he's so tired of the tricks that Br'er Fox has been playing on him that it's time to play a trick on Br'er Fox. He sees Br'er Fox and Br'er Bar lurking in the bushes outside his window. So Br'er Rabbit holds up a box of diamonds for Br'er Fox to see and says loud enough for him to hear, I scared to keep all my diamonds around the house. I think I'll hide them out in the cornfield when nobody would suspect. At this, Br'er Fox's eyes spin around in his head. A little later, Br'er Rabbit is out in his cornfield, still holding the box of diamonds. And he says, loud enough for Br'er Fox and Br'er Bar to hear, I'll put the diamonds in different ears all over the field, and nobody will ever find them. And Br'er Fox's eyes spin around again at sight of the diamonds. And he says softly to Brewer Bar, He's there, nobody but us. That night, when the moonlight comes up, last picture top row, Brewer Fox and Brewer Bar are in Brewer Rabbit's cornfield, jerking the corn ears off the stalks and husking them, looking for the diamonds. Finally, Brewer Bar says, I ain't found nothing yet. Is you? 
Brer Fox replies, Hey, keep looking. First picture, bottom row. Hours later, Brer Bar nears the end of his row and he exclaims angrily, Well, what you suppose has done happened to them diamonds? Brer Fox snarls, Keep a pulling. Finally, they've picked all the corn, cleaned the ears, and thrown them to the ground. And they're all worn out, but they haven't found one diamond. And Brer Bar moans, But we both see them put the stuff in the corn. And Brer Fox answers, and now he's all out of here. After a while in town, Brer Fox and Brer Bar, in front of the general store, all tired out from the night's work, see Brer Rabbit coming down the street, pulling a load of corn. Brer Rabbit greets everyone. Morning, gentlemen. Nice day we've got. Brer Coon, who had seen Brer Rabbit's corn unpicked the day before, asks, Hey, how'd you get all your corn picked this soon, Brer Rabbit? And Brer Rabbit replies, last picture. Oh, I has got secret agents working for me. Whereupon Brer Fox and Brer Bar stalk angrily out of town because they realized Rabbit had tricked them into picking the corn for him. And Uncle Remus says, Yeah, there's more than one way to skin a cat if you is got the cat. <laughs> Yeah. He thinks he's so smart, he thought he was going to steal Br'er Rabbit's diamonds. And instead <laughs> learns that Br'er Rabbit has tricked him into picking his corn for him, which is a lot of hard work. <laughs> he certainly is mad, isn't he? Yes, and I think he's madder at himself for being fooled than he is at Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> yes. Well, now... Oh, oh, now I like to read that good and Blondie. Well, then, let's pick up the first page of the second section, and here we go with Blondie and Dagwood. Ramafu, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. It's raining. Dagwood says, I love a rainy day. It creates the mood. And he settles down on the sofa and sighs, I like to just lie on my back and listen to the bitter patter of the raindrops and meditate. And then the door opens. And Herb Woodley, his neighbor, steps in, last picture top row, and Herb shouts, Hey, Bumstead, I want the umbrella you borrowed for me last August. I returned that umbrella months ago. You did not. Whereupon? I said I did do return that umbrella. You did not. Blondie dashes in. Boys, boys, stop arguing. Well, he's got my stop umbrella. Stop arguing now. She stops the fight and gives Herb his umbrella. And as he goes to the door with a smile on his face, she tells Dagwood, We'll just put those idle hands to work so they won't have time to get in trouble. Last picture, second row. Dagwood's on the ladder with a pail in a mop and a frown on his face. Blondie tells him, You can listen to the pitter-patter of the raindrops while you wash the woodwork. <laughs> short time later, the door opens. And in come all the kids in the neighborhood. They rush into the room, knock over Dagwood's ladder, and as he falls to the floor, first picks the bottom row, he shouts, It's the A-bomb! And the kids shout, Hey, let's play, he's the bad guy, and tie him up with a rope, okay, huh? Yeah, let's play, he's the bad guy, and tie him up, okay. A moment later, there's a... It's Dagwood dashing out of the house, pulling on his coat. last picture, he sits in a park bench between two hobos, an umbrella over his head in the pouring rain. And he snarls, I hate rain. And the hobo answers, Yeah, me too. He was going to have a nice, lazy day at home because he loves the rain. And here he is in the last picture saying he hates the rain because he has to be out in it. Well, he's right about one thing. <laughs> What's that? He said that rain creates a mood, and it sure did. <laughs> yes, the look on his face shows he's in a bad mood. <laughs> yeah, you bet he is. Now? Oh, look, here's Roy Rogers right underneath that wooden blunder. And I'll read that in just a moment, but first here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. hi yip hi Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi -yo. Roy 
and Dolfo Hawkins had been locked in the caboose, which the rustlers, Dude and Rocky, had sent plunging down the tracks. But Roy and Dolfo escaped as they went over the cliff and then were met by Judd Meeker, leader of the rustlers, who had come riding along. Meeker, who had never met Dude and Rocky, thought Roy and Dolfo were the unknown rustlers. He had paid them off and then told them to be at his ranch that afternoon. Later, Roy and Dolfo came upon Dude and Rocky's camp when they were trying to get their horses back again. And they were captured by Dude and Rocky. And now, their hands bound behind them, they are being taken to Meeker's ranch. As the horses come onto a wooden bridge, suddenly Roy shouts, Now, Dolfo! And Roy and Dolfo turn their horses on Dude and Rocky and crowd them off the bridge into the water below. Then they gallop for Meeker's ranch. First picture, next row. They come to Meeker's ranch and see the corral below with the stolen cattle inside. As they ride into the camp, they are greeted by Meeker. Second picture, bottom row. Well, great Scott, it's my new employees, Dude and Rocky. Uh, what happened, gentlemen? Roy replies, untie us quick, will you, boss? We just escaped from two law dogs. Hey, how many steers you got here? As Meeker unties them, Roy looks at the cattle, whose original brands have been covered by Meeker's. Roy exclaims, hey, what kind of brand blotting do you call that? Meeker replies, you're asking a lot of questions, dude, Dawson. You should know I use stencils and acid instead of irons. Hey, who's this coming? It's Dude and Rocky, the real rustlers. Dude says, That creek Duncan ruined this new set of duds. I'd like to get my hands on Rogers. Last picture, Rocky replies, Well, you're gonna get your wish, Dude. I see both Rogers and Hawkins down there with a the boy. Well, that really is something, but we'll find out next week, I am positive and sure. Well, I can hardly wait to find out, because if Meeker really believes Dude, well, then Roy and Dolph will surely be in danger, because they're all surrounded by wrestlers. Yes, you bet they'll be in danger, but we'll know about that next week. Now? Now, let's turn over the page. All right, over we go. Oh, and look, here's Flash Gordon. Oh, yes, and he's on the planet Mars. And you remember last week he stopped a terrific hurricane that looked like it was going to kill everybody. But by quick thinking and using the powerful machines of the Martians, Flash had saved the city by first setting the sandstorm afire, then freezing the flames into huge walls that the hurricane couldn't flow through. But then they learned that the walls had dammed up the river and that the city was going to be flooded. Well, let's see whether Flash can stop this new danger. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. In the Martian Queen's bubble like scout ship, propelled by electron beams, Flash surveys the flood that is engulfing the planet's capital. The canal is hopelessly dammed by miles of storm drifted, frozen desert dunes. It appears that the great city is doomed to complete destruction. Last picture, top row. Suddenly, Flash gets an idea for a bold plan that may turn the dread flood waters into a boon for Mars. With a super, with a super bomb blast, we can form a crater that'll serve as a huge reservoir on the edge of the city. First picture, next row. As the scout ship poises on its repulsor beams near the levee, Flash dives into the storm-tossed canal with his small but deadly load, a directional hydrocarbon torpedo bomb. He disappears under the water. To the anxious Dale, it seems that Flash has been under the turbulent water for hours. Finally, she utters a cry of joy as she sees Flash emerge after having planted the mighty charm. He shouts, The time fuse is set to go off in five minutes. But now, Queen Menta shows herself to be cruel and ruthless. She refuses to risk her life for Flash, even though he's saved her city. She orders the pilot to move away at full speed saying the tiny fuse might explode while they are picking Flash up, that even if Flash may be killed, the Queen of Mars will not... And Flash, last picture, is horrified to see the ship moving away. Oh, isn't she terrible? She's 
worse than terrible. She's cruel. How will Flash ever escape if they go away and leave him there? Well, that's something I couldn't figure out. I hope Dale can do something so Flash will be safe. Well, we'll discover that next week. Now I think it's time for Dick's Adventures. Oh, yes, and I'm anxious to read that. Very well, turn to the last page, the very last page, and there he is. And this is so exciting, too, because Dick is in the early days of America with Captain Lewis and Captain Clark on, on a thrilling expedition into the Wild West. Yes, and... last week they escaped from the Indians, and now they're making their way up the Missouri River, which has been frozen over. And they're, they're breaking ice with long poles, and that is very dangerous because those ice chunks are sharp, and they could cut holes in their boat. And there's another danger. The Indians on shore, silently waiting. But now let's see what happens with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack is that is it. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Captain Lewis stands in the prow of the boat, watching the huge ice chunks grind away. He says, It's a devil's choice, Dick, between being ground up by the icy Missouri or attacked by the strange Indians. Dick replies, Well, I'd rather face the Indians, sir. And so it's decided to move into shore where the Indians stand silently watching. Tied to shore, last picture top row, they meet the Indians, who prove friendly. More than that, the gigantic chief known to the French trappers as Le Bourne, the One-Eyed, provides a winter campsite under the high bluffs by the river's edge. The men go to work at once, building log cabins, which will be homes for them during the coming winter. And then the completed blockhouse is christened Fort Mandan. The Indians come bringing gifts of deer, wild fowl, and buffalo meat. And a joyful party is held in the wilderness. And the Indians and the white men teach one another dance steps. But then, a few weeks later, without reason, the Indian friendship ceases. They refuse to accept the gifts that Dick offers to Le Bourne and his people. And last picture, to find out the cause of this dissatisfaction, Lewis and Clark call a consul of the chiefs. And they come through the snow, silent and sullen, led by Le Bourne. <laughs> going to be friendly because I thought then their troubles would be over for the winter anyway. Yes, I felt the very same way too. I wonder why the Indians have changed. Why aren't they nice anymore? Well, maybe we'll learn the reason next week at the consul that Captain Lewis has called. Oh, I hope so. So do I. But now... Oh, look, underneath it, here's Rusty Riley. Yes. And you remember the two Englishmen, Sir Percival and, and Nobby? They're crooks and they're visiting Mr. Miles' farm. And Mr. Miles trusts them. He doesn't know that they're crooks. And what's more, he's taken Sir Percival to dinner at the country club. And then Nobby, he's, he's pretending to be Sir Percival's chauffeur. And he has driven them there. And then when they went inside to eat, he came back to the Milestone Farm. And Rusty and Pete had heard him in the driveway. Yes, and so the boys have decided to investigate. And I was so worried. Those two little boys are going to investigate when a cruel crook is around. Well, let's read right now and find out what they discover. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and rusty. The boys peek through the window, and they see that the window to Mr. Miles' study is open. So they decide to go down into the driveway where they can see better. <laughs> A few minutes later, as they hide behind some bushes, they see a man coming out of the window carrying a bundle. They see him go down the driveway, last picture top row. Rusty exclaims, Hey, golly, Pete, he looks like Sir Percival's man, Nobbs. Pete whispers, 
Yeah, it's going out to the main road. Hey, let's tell Tex. <laughs> First picture bottom row, they discover that Tex isn't there, and no one else is around either. Pete exclaims, Hey, good night, Rusty. We gotta do something. And as I see it, there's only one thing left. Get out my jalopy and follow him. Rusty exclaims, Well, golly, Pete, we can't do that. You gave your word that you wouldn't drive it till after you're old enough for a license. <laughs> At the country club, last picture, Mr. Miles and Sir Percival have finished their dinner. As they leave their table, Sir Percival is saying, I say, Mr. Miles, been really topping of you to have me as a guest at Milestone. But now I, I really must be on my way. Nobs has my luggage, so uh, I, I won't go back to the farm. Mr. Miles replies, Well, I'm sorry to have you leave us, Sir Percival. But I trust that you'll pay us a return visit in the near future. Oh, isn't that a shame? Mr. Miles says that Percival has to leave, and, and he says they're not even going to go back to the farm at all. Yes, just think that Nobbs has already stolen the valuable cups and is already on his way there to the place, and if he gets in the car and Mr. Miles... Let them get away. You'll never know. Maybe they'll never be caught. No, maybe they won't. Maybe nobody will ever catch him. There's only one chance. What? And that chance is, uh, it's Pete and Rusty come to the country club and tell Mr. Miles what's happened. Oh, that'd be a good thing. And I do hope they will get there in time. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Bigley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend Miss Honey next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Thank <laughs> you.